Just set it right over there by the lamp, sweetie. Thanks. Actually, just a minute. Who does that parcel claim to be from? Oh, looks like uh, Conway and Blue made it ashore. I think Blue's staring at us. <laughs> Watching. Hmm. That's weird. There's no label on it. Well, for Lucky, it's chocolates from a secret admirer. And not a snake from an assassin. So, who are you? Do you work for the post office? Or the tugboat? I only ask because I haven't seen you before. Was that you I heard chatting down the hall? Yeah, I, I just met Dashiel. He's been working on that obsolete ringer, hasn't he? Ah, poor Dashiel. You know, he's not really... He was let go a while back. A long while, actually. When they started restructuring, he was one of the first to go. But he talked them into letting him come every day and fiddle with some interminable project. He says it's to keep a long gap from growing his resume, but I think he just has nothing better to do. One of those old men who needs to work, you know? Doesn't know how to be any other way. Well, there are no real jobs here, and there are fake jobs, I guess. It wasn't always like this. When I came to work at the Echo River Central Exchange, there were 12 of us. Loretta, Edna, Meg, Kara, Mary, Louise, Liz, Hester, Angie, Wilma, Connie. I was number 12. Connie and I were hired on the same day, but she showed up early. Mary finished college, and Hester was fired for snapping at a rude collar. But he had it coming, and I hear she did just fine on her own. So they hired Beryl, Yana, and Sachiko, which brought us up to 13. And that was as many operators as we ever had here at one time. The power company came along, buying up all the lines, and one day they took the exchange as a throw-in, like it was nothing. Nothing. And they started phasing us out. Edna, Meg, Cara, and Louise left one Friday evening, and were asked not to come back on Monday morning. Beryl saw the writing on the wall and quickly found employment at a private PBX. They had Yana and Liz stop routing calls, and write up some kind of best practices document instead. It was their final task as exchange employees. Some of the girls were reassigned to other divisions. Connie, I think, was checking residential meters. So Chico and Wilma were moved into energy sales, cold calling businesses to see if they needed to upgrade their electricity plan. At least they were still on the phone. Then it was just Loretta, Angie, and me. We were swamped. The hours were hell and hard on the throat. The voice with a smile became a croak. I was gargling warm salt water in the break room, sipping from a thermos full of hot honey broth stashed under my chair. Oh, I brought a lot of extended techniques to the switchboard in those days. Sounded pretty good to me. He's got the voltage too high. He'll burn out the relay. So, where was I? Extended switchboard technique? It was all about timing your breath. Some girls got lightheaded doing too many calls in a row with that upbeat dynamic inflection that made us... Um, they made us use to keep everything intelligible. It was very physical. So, after a few months, it was just me. A new automation strategy was announced, and this place was rechristened Consolidated Auxiliary Switch Number 30. If it's automated, what do you do here? It's not fully automated. There are still gaps in functionality that need a human touch. And, you know, it really is all about touch here. Sound is a vibration, a touch you feel in your ear. So my voice is my touch. When we're talking, we're touching. Even on the phone. That's an electric touch, an intimate little shock that makes your tiny hairs tremble. But that's not even what I mean when I say it's all about touch here. When the power company first tried automating this old exchange with fancy new transistor arrays, the switchboard caught fire. It was just too much, too fast. 
so they tried using some clunky old mechanical relays, but then the calls were getting mismatched and out of sync. It was a nightmare. Their technicians determined that the phone system down here had been designed ad hoc over decades around the specific tempo of its human operators. So, short of replacing the whole thing, not to mention all the wiring, they'd have to work out the exact timing of every little human gesture that goes into routing a phone call. And that, officially, is my role here. I run the switchboard for the whole exchange. Once the work of 12, I'd like to remind you. They have some kind of machine somewhere that tracks how long it takes me to do each little thing. The caller never hears my voice now. They dial, my little indicator light switches on, and I make the connection. Interesting. What's the machine like? Oh, it's... funny. I've never actually seen it. They told me just to carry on patching while it collects and collates in the background until it's ready to take over. Hmm. There's a dark thought. What if there's no cheap machine that's going to replace me? What if it's cheaper just to keep me here, filling in for the rhythm of the operators? What if I'm the cheap machine? You're not a machine. Nice of you to notice. <laughs> I mourn the Echo River Central Exchange, and I'll carry a, a torch for the voice with a smile. But at least I'm keeping some part of it human, right? Even if it's not the best part. Oh, the parcel. Right over there by the lamp is fine. Thanks for dropping that off. Take care. Think of me when you dial zero. <laughs> Once again, zero has that weird look, and also, what is that static? Ugh. They're creepy. She returned on the dinghy alone. Wait. Alone? She had a strong and sudden urge to shut the motor off and let the current take her, but she couldn't work out where that impulse came from, so she did her best to resist it. Did they just take Conway? She met a guitar player pedaling a floating bicycle with his dog in tow. He said they took turns. The water was cold and the floating bicycle, while technically marvelous, wasn't quite buoyant enough for the both of them. Swimming is hard work. The hardest work that dog had ever done, he expected. They had been traveling this way for most of the night, struggling through the icy water, stopping to recover when they could find a rock large enough to start a small campfire. He had his belongings stuffed into a weathered guitar case at the end of a thin rope. It floated pretty well so only had to keep an eye on it and occasionally free it from a rock or some driftwood it was caught on. She invited him to ride a ways on the dinghy. He appreciated the offer, but they weren't in a hurry. She met a flower salesman on a raft. They floated alongside in buoyant pots, bobbing untethered. He corralled them with a long pole and a stream of small adjustments. She leaned out over the water to get a closer look. He just started work for the day, so his stock was full. He pushed a few bouquets her way. First was a delicate mixture of pansies, arranged in the Byzantine style. He said it was for a particular kind of person. If it didn't remind her of anyone in specific, she'd better move on. Next, 
a rustic bundle of blue petaled flowers of many different types. He suggested it would make an appropriate thinking of you bouquet. Finally, a delicate mass of roses, made to look messy. She thought it looked serene, and he agreed. He drifted away with the current, pushing his flowers along with the raft. She met a family of five on a flat-bottomed skiff. The boat was loaded to capacity with black plastic bags and a few larger pieces of furniture wrapped in a blue tarp. Three paddled, the two adults and the older child. The two younger children slept. They'd been traveling all night, first by car and then for the last few hours by boat. Hungry and tired, they didn't plan to stop until they reached West Virginia, where a relative had offered to take them in. But the adults were happy to take a break from paddling in weary silence. They asked her about her river journey. She told them about the memorial. They were sympathetic, no minors in their family. But he was once injured at a warehouse job and had to fight for disability pay. They knew what these companies were like, and what it was like to have to assert your humanity to them. They wished her well and paddled on toward West Virginia. She gave in, shut off the motor and floated for a while. Then she knew what she'd been craving, a moment of silence. I was not expecting that to be so abrupt. Conway just being carried off or whatever. I didn't even see him. I mean, was he one of those crystalline figures in the boat? Like, <laughs> had he become fully crystalline? Hello out there. Headed up or down? Uh, I'm just looking for the crew of the Mucky Mammoth. Yes, ma'am. They stop here every morning. I expect they're upstairs now, and Ida's got the coffee going. I could use a cup myself. It's cold down there. Well, head on upstairs, and she'll take care of you. I'll be along in a minute. Just in time. We've already finished eating, but we're about to place a to-go order for Clara. She's back on board, getting ready for her show. Take a look at the menu. I'm sure there's something you'll like. Ida is a bit of a local celebrity. For her cooking, I mean. Hey, Ezra was just asking about you. He's around the corner playing a video game. Maybe go let him know you two are back, or... Where's the old man, anyway? Ah, bad luck. You'll get it next time. To Shannon. Hey, you got a quarter? He's almost got this. It's true. Sh 
Sure, I have one quarter. Thank you. So, uh, where's... They took him. Damn. Yeah. He really got himself in a situation there. Yeah. I'm gonna go sit down. Cool. Uh, the food is as good here. I think everyone else is finishing up, but you could probably get something to go. To Ezra. Alright, Claw Maestro. Let's give it another shot. So, let's see what's on top of that pile here. There's a stuffed octopus, a plastic bag full of clamshells, a cowboy hat, and some big headphones. That octopus has a leg wrapped around the boombox underneath it. The shells are pretty clear, but I don't know if the claw can really grip the bag well. The cowboy hat is in the corner, so it's kind of tricky to tell if it's wedged in or not. Those headphones might be a good bet, but I can't see the cord. It could be wrapped around something. What are you going to try for? I'll try the headphones. Good call. I think that's our best bet. Okay, when I put this quarter in, you'll have about eight seconds to grab your prize. The headphones are on the right, pretty close to the middle. Let me know if you need any help lining it up. I've got a slightly different view of the field from up here. Ready? Here we go. Johnny inserts the coin and the machine awakens. Eight seconds. The claw hovers in the front left corner of the machine. Oh, I'm actually... I had to pay attention to where it was, did I? Uh, was it top right? Right? Kala hovers halfway across the front of the machine. Up. Hovers in the center of the machine. Does this look right? Too far to the left. So, let's go right. Does this look right? Yeah, looks good to me. Go for it. Alright, do it. Drop the claw. It grabs the headphones. The claw returns to the front of the machine with the headphones in a tight grip. Drops them through a slot labeled Prize, where Ezra retrieves them. Whoa, nice work. Now we just have to find you something to plug those into. Hey, listen. Sounds like that old man you were following around, uh... I guess he had to leave. I should go with him. Oh, uh... No, that's not a good idea. It's not a place for kids, where he's headed. Anyway, I don't know what kind of plans you have now, but... If you need help figuring out your next move, you can always talk to me and Miss Junebug. Just wanted to make sure you know that. Could I keep going with you? Hey, I've got no objection. We have a pretty ad hoc thing going on, me and Junebug. I'd have to talk to her, but I bet you're welcome to tag along for a while, if you're into it. Hey, maybe we still have time to poke around this place a little. They have some pretty wild stuff in here. Hey, did you see this? They keep a table full of fake food over here. I've never known why. Actually, I think it might be real food coated with shellac or something. Preserved. Oh, and look! This tentacle-looking thing is half-eaten. This is someone's meal that they didn't finish? Tentacle? Gross. Man, I don't know. Some people really like that stuff. I had some fried calamari once at a gas station. It was pretty good. But I stripped a gear trying to chew the beak. They're supposed to take that out. If Sam and Ida preserved this half-eaten meal, it must have been pretty important to them, right? Maybe it belonged to someone they care about. 
like a beloved uncle had a mid-meal stroke, so they kept it in his memory. <laughs> that would be a very strange thing. Yeah, like these sunflower seeds my folks left behind. Oh, I'm sure your folks are fine, though. Are you worried about them? Yes. It's weird that they just disappeared. Yeah. Listen. That's okay to be worried. You're doing fine. Weird. Somehow I thought it was his truck. And delivery and all. It was, that's what she's saying. But he gave it to her before they took him away. To Shannon. But you're going to deliver it anyway? Why? He's my friend. He needs my help to finish his job. That's right. He's our friend too. Johnny and I will help you unload when we get there. To Johnny? Lift with your legs, Cricket. Yes, ma'am. So, how was everything? To Junebug, how was the sweet cave snail? Devastating. You're a killer, Ida. Well, I can't take all the credit. Sam came across a whole cave snail colony down there about a year back, and we've been leaving rock candy for them to gorge on since. We just started harvesting earlier this month. Yes, it's all about patience down here. Everything grows more slowly in the dark. There's a fish in Lake Lef that lives to 200 years, and its flavor profile only develops at about 75. I've got a pot of bones in there that's been stewing for at least a week. I don't even remember why I put them on. Come to think of it, I don't even remember what kind of bones they are. Oh, we need one for the road. Clara said she wanted, um... Something primordial, she said. What does that mean? Kate reviews the menu. I think she meant something from very deep in the lake. Ah, could be. Hands Jen in the menu. Here, you pick. I'm no good at this. Shannon inspects the menu. She'll have... Hmm... Salamander log. Sweetwater cuttlefish spread, balsamic spinach. Crab and tomato cakes with Kentucky remoulade. Mollusk cakes with orange butter sauce. Aged blind cavefish and small salad. Aged blind cavefish sounds primordial. But let's see what else is here. Blind salamander, black bean soup, mussel hot pot, poached barnacle, lamb and cavefish gumbo, cedar plank blind prawn with parmesan red pepper crust and butter sauce, grilled squid wrap. Oh my god, how much? This menu is huge. Basic steamed crabs, mollusk and spinach fritters with lemon sauce, Ida smoked crayfish spread with Kentucky toast. How many are there? I think, are we back or... Blind salamander log. I think we... Didn't we already see that one? But mussels with pickled white carrot... Mionette sauce and balsamic broccoli. Those weren't on there before. Is it, like, random? Um... Should I keep going till I see the old one? That I, that I was going to go with before? Uh... This is really hard to pick. Uh, salted eel with bread and cavefish. Yes. No! I picked the wrong one. I accidentally went with cave salamander and broccoli cakes with Cajun remoulade. Okay. <laughs> Good choice. Your friend will love it. I'll have that right out, sweetie. Ezra leans over the table and carefully examines the preserved food and drink. He 
He prods a half-eaten tentacle. The tentacle is solid and fixed in place. We used to steam those. Juicy. But I prefer them smoked now. Sorry I startled you, sweetie. Why is it hard? We covered it in shellac. Do you know what shellac is? It's bug wax. This food is about 15 years old. It's true. Things were different then. Nobody came to eat here. We were fighting just to keep the lights on. Sam, my husband, Sam, was depressed. He couldn't catch anything. That was part of the problem. Most of what we served was shipped and frozen or dried, and I just threw it in the fryer. We've both come a long way since then. Well, two young men came in for dinner. Seasoned divers, they said, over 10,000 hours between them and Lake Leth alone. They'd been out all day, salvaging parts from a riverboat wreck, and had worked up a fierce hunger, they said. They ordered the whole menu, without even looking. It was a short menu in those days. I sat them right here, and went back to the kitchen. Sam was at the next table doing a sudoku and drinking malt liquor, his usual routine at the time. An hour later, I was cleaning up when Sam came bursting into the kitchen. Ida, he said, kind of frantic. These divers are still hungry. Bring them another course. And I said, they already ordered the whole menu. Sam said, make something new. Keep making up dishes, whatever, just keep bringing out food. So I did until the small hours of the morning. I made up so many new dishes that night, I could write a book. And it was good. Inspired. But I was working so hot and fast at the burning edge of inspiration, I didn't think to write any of it down. And I was so wrecked with exhaustion the next day, I knew I couldn't remember what all I'd done in the kitchen. Sam thought we could take a photograph of the leftovers, but we couldn't get the lighting right, so we just shellacked the whole table. Now when I need inspiration for the menu, I come and look here and think about all those ingenious dishes I threw together for those divers. Of course, they didn't pay their full bill. I heard one of them complaining to the other. I should just pay half and let them charge the other half to whatever demon in the kitchen kept making up food faster than we could ask for it. But it all worked out. Things have really turned around since then. This place is actually pretty popular now. The success on our extended menu inspired Sam, too. He started bringing back the most magnificent ingredients from his nightly dives. I'd better get to work. Stay right here, sweetie, and I'll bring you a treat on my way back out. <laughs> what a cool place. Ooh, what's that? Sam got a eel, maybe? Well, buddy, guess you're the catch of the day. The one and only. So, what are you? You look like, well, some kind of eel, I guess. Kind of a mopey little guy, huh? Yeah, I can see it in your eyes. You smell like... sort of buttery. Well, that should be just fine. Skin feels like... sandpaper. Huh. Well, should figure something out. I think I'll call you... Gray Eel. Welcome to Sam and Ida's. The one and only Gray Eel. Hope you enjoy your stay. I mean, not too much. Have you ever seen a creature like me before? You're pretty far down there. Wouldn't be surprised if I'm the first. Except... There were two divers who went before me, long ago. Maybe that was before your time. How old are you anyway, I wonder? They ate here once, back in the bad old days. Two young guys, could have been brothers maybe. I was over in the corner with my coffee and crossword. I hadn't been able to catch a thing, so I'd have just fried up something from Frozen. Well, these guys were hungry enough to eat it, and ask for more and they did at least as much talking as eating. See, like I said, they were divers, and like I said, they might have been brothers. They had kind of a rivalry going between them or something. I was about to write up their check, but I slipped calmly and quietly into the kitchen for a minute and told her to just keep bringing out food. I figured they wouldn't notice, caught up in their boasting as they were. 
and I wanted to listen. They went back and forth for hours about all the deep and dangerous dives they'd been on, new tunnels they'd discovered, all the weird creatures they'd encountered at the weirdest depths of Lake Leth. It was like a dance. No, like a boxing match. Each story went deeper than the last. And I listened to every word of it, memorized every description of every tunnel and diving route they'd discovered. That's my map now, you see? For 15 years I've been using routes those two young divers discussed right there at that table. Yeah, I could write a guidebook to the depths of this lake, but I don't dare. Someone would steal my good diving spots, and then where would we be? See, people come here from all over just to try our daily catch, because they know it's unique. Ain't you proud? Since I can't write any of it down, I just preserve that table where they had their meal so I can look at it to jog my memory. Like, they were eating pickled crab when they talked about that shipwreck full of salamanders. Pretty clever, huh? It's my own secret code. Well, I'll be straight with you, Grey Eel. There's one feature of this arrangement that I find unsettling. In fact, I lose a decent amount of sleep over it. I told you those boys were competing, right? One-upping each other, I mean? Each getting wilder and more adventurous as they traded tales? Well, I navigate mostly in the dark down there, just going by a touch and a kind of mental picture I can construct from their detailed boasts. And every time I explore a new diving spot from those recollections, I have to weigh it all against the risk that I'm heading right into a dangerous falsehood. One of those men could have felt for a moment like he was losing some ground in their little duel, so he could have slipped a fake one in there. Maybe told a fib about some dive he went on and found a colony of blind shrimp living in a discarded refrigerator. And when I get down there, my diving bell cracks open on a sharp rock where he said that fridge would be, and that's the end of Sam, of Sam and Ida's. To be honest, that possibility puts the fear of death in me every time I touch water. Hey Sam, good all tonight? We'll see what you can make of it. Yeah, pretty good I think. Get some trouble down by the narrow tunnel. Some kind of fast growing freshwater barnacle just about sealed it up. I picked away for half an hour before I gave up and went around the other way. But I got the catch of the day. That's the important part. That's what people travel for. Are there a lot of fish in this lake? It seems so quiet. Yeah, there's a fish or two. Not too many. It's not like a surface lake where you've got sunlight uh, propping up the food chain. Life down here grows slowly, patiently, quietly. Will you stay for a drink? I've got a dark rum that goes well with coffee. Uh, I think we're about to leave, but thanks. Just passing through. Hey, aren't we all? Oh, she's got your food ready. You all enjoy your meal, alright? Open door, and I can 
feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving mother up in glory land, and I don't expect to stop until. She's waiting now for me in heaven's open door, and I can feel at home in this world anymore. Oh. like you if heaven's not my home oh lord what will i do angels beckon me to heaven's open door and i can feel at home this game is so beautiful isn't it she returns to the tugboat Alright, well, I think I'll end the episode there. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and I'll be back soon.